come to the dinner table in, in jeans, and uh, he would put his legs under him on the chair uh -huh. when he sat to eat. And I thought it was a strange, uh, amusing thing to do. But uh -huh. it was only when I lived in Japan I realized it's normal mm -hmm. Japanese style. Uh, they're used to sitting on the floor and not on chairs to begin with. And they always fold their legs. So uh, I was used to. Of course, nowadays they don't. Most of them do sit on chairs, in fact. Uh, that for the ladies, they want their leg line. They lose their legs. Well, they're about in handsome proportion, uh -huh. <laughs> because their thighs develop too much. They're right. calves, rather. Yeah. Uh, you can almost tell by looking at the leg line of a lady in Japan whether she sits the uh, traditional style or not. Uh, but uh, that, that, and it, the general informality of these people and the warmth of them as against the Americans, uh, I guess, drew me. I was much closer to them, although there were uh, Harvey Shapiro, who was at the thing last night, was there at the same time with me. So I knew him from 1950 when we were together there. But his interests were quite different from mine. He was, uh, he was involved in cultivating the better known poets there at the time. And I, was, I hadn't written so much then, and I was very quiet. It was the beginning of, uh, of my work, actually, serious work. And it was an important. I was on radio then. Uh, during yeah, that, that was a vacation for me. It was the first time I'd ever really stayed in a country place in my life. Hmm. So that uh, it was. An experience oh, you stayed for that. at this place. Yeah. Oh. And they wanted me to stay for two months, but I said I can't because I have an engagement with the radio, and I had left it in charge of a friend of mine who was a, had been a listener of mine. Mm -hmm. Maybe the first time, probably the only time that a blind person was put in charge of a, uh, of a poetry program. Hmm. And he was one of my top listeners. He's now the head of personnel at Prudential in Boston. Mm -hmm. he, was, uh, he was at Harvard then. He was very bright, nice uh, Armenian family in Watertown uh, near Cambridge. The head of Prudential? No, they didn't then. No, I see. He's the head? He's the head of personnel. personnel. I saw him when I was back in Boston. Uh, and a very assured person, and gradually, as he heard my voice, he remembered my uh, the sound of my voice. My brother, uh, there, the younger brother, knew. Yeah, that, Len. Yeah, Len knew that he was uh, had seen him some several times because he lived very near him, nice. near the Prudential Center. So that uh, it was uh, it was weird the, these connections that mm. come. Well, I. Reminds me of another story uh, that happened just uh, about a month ago or, or less in Japan. A letter that came to me from a girl in uh, Connecticut, in Gil Guilford, my brother says it's called pronounced not Guilford, Guilford. Uh, and who's from that area originally? But I get this letter that was sent to the gallery in, in the Yamada Gallery in. Kyoto. So I knew it was somebody that had been out of touch with me for a long time because I had no contact there for some years already. Uh, and, uh, and the name I couldn't recognize at all. It had no meaning for me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand who was writing me. I opened it up and the first sentence says, I, the last time I wrote you was 25 years ago. Uh, she was a student at Bennington when she wrote me the last time. Mm -hmm. Now she's 47 years old. She's writing me after this interval. And she has two grown-up daughters, one at university, the other uh, a final year in high school. And she's married uh, to a man that she said has been a beautiful marriage. She's been very happy with her life. And uh, she, uh, she wanted to thank me because I had encouraged her writing and published a little of it in my magazine when she was in her early 20s and mm -hmm. a student there mm -hmm. at the school. Uh, I remembered her maiden name very well, but uh, the marriage name, of course, I didn't know. Her husband is uh, the principal of a, a, a elementary school in the area, and she does work with children, and she's written many children's books, she says, and one or two, I think, by larger publishers. But uh, she's had some success with that, and I told her to go on with it. It sounded right. But uh, I suggested she might enjoy coming down here She's dead. Uh, 
Chief told me. She I, yeah, but I had forgotten, typical of me, to forget mm -hmm. <laughs> those details. I nearly killed my blind friend, actually, walking on the street with him once, because I had forgotten he was blind. <laughs> And I was doing my usual jaywalking style, <laughs> and we were just talking. Uh, a very lovely girl, and, uh, as I recall, and uh, she, yeah, it was prose of hers that I had published and also, but with a, a kind of feeling of poetry, and uh, it was very nice to hear that she's made out very well. Yeah, so and she works with deaf children as well. Mm. She said she can't hear, and it, 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 what little sound comes through is, uh, is, a, is just a dazzle of sound. Mm. Probably worse than yes. being totally deaf. She said, of course, writing to you, there's no problem. <laughs> so, the, the nice guy, you know, uh, one of my Canadian friends, a uh, young boy, a very handsome, striking kid, crazy kid climbed up the side of Notre Dame one night uh, with me. I, w I said, you do it. <laughs> and he did. But uh, he, uh, he was the son of a bishop in Canada. And he still lived in He's from Canada. And he was very striking. He looked a little like him. And he knew his father was a dear friend of Billy Graham. So he looked a little like Billy Graham very blonde and very striking and dynamic type of personality. He was always going to write a great novel, and he had endless notebooks. Nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. And he knew all the publishers. He had gone over and met T.S. Eliot in London. He knew Sam Beckett in Paris. He knew everybody, all the key figures, but he never wrote the book. He was always talking of writing the great book, but he never did it. Uh, anyway. He was, he had a little fling with this girl, and it was through him that I got to know her a little. Uh, I never was, uh, had any relation with her beyond just being friendly with her. She was just a baby. 17 years old, and on her 17th birthday, she threw up her arms and said, I haven't done anything with my life. <laughs> Classic statement. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, which endeared me dearly to her. <laughs> And uh, anyway, we, uh, she helped me when I went to Italy. She pay, paid for her, I mean, the first book I did down there. And I dedicated the book to her and another friend who had helped me out also, but uh, Lady Fred. But uh, there she was standing in front of me. Well, what had happened was she married while she was there when she was about 18. While I was, was still she there, married? she married him, an, an old, uh, an old by that, by her standards, he was in his thirties, British painter, and everybody, you know, and I too said, "Oh, well, that won't work. I'm sure that maybe he's marrying her for money or this jazz." And the guy standing beside her was him. <laughs> they had a wonderful marriage, in fact, it's incredible, and uh, it was beautiful. But uh, this was so. What would it be? Twelve years ago or so. Mm -hmm. If you live long enough, some of these funny things happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you live a little longer. Oh, I think so. A lot longer. Mm -hmm. I have other things to do. <laughs> you, you look pretty good. Well, I think you do. Oh, is it? Yeah, maybe too hard. Are you going to ask anybody here um, about the letters to sell the letters? Or uh, well, I said that you might uh, ask someone. Or yeah, well, I are? will speak. Uh, well, I write. I have been writing uh, to various places. Oh. But it will be part of a larger package, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to raise a million dollars, so I, I want mm -hmm. to sell all my papers and books to somebody. 
uh, who will then maybe give them to an archives or one of the libraries. So if there's some wealthy people or a consortium of wealthy people who will do that uh, and uh, take care of my money problems for me the rest of my life, and I don't have to have that in my head. Uh, that would be a great help and would pay for the book as well. trick. And uh, I've got all sorts of ideas of how it could be arranged. That is, that if they paid me over a period of 10 years, it would be fine. And if they wanted to break it off at any point, it would be all right. I, uh, once they made an initial payment, that would get me off the ground, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, because I can raise money for the book, I think, uh, privately as well. Uh, because I will do a special edition uh, of 25 copies. 25? and sell them at $2,000 each. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I can find 15 people at least, and that would pay for the book, a uh, subscription. Uh, if, if you do 25 copies if I sell them, uh, at, at, at $2,000 $2, each, 25, right. that's 50000 That would be more than enough to publish a single volume. I oh, I see. And I would uh, finance the other volumes in a similar way. So that way I would be covered on the thing. Well, I wouldn't sell or be able to sell 25, but I could sell a dozen, mm -hmm. and that would be enough uh, to get to get you moving. To get me moving, mm -hmm. uh, I think I could raise 30,000, which is what I'll need. What is a uh, volume? Uh, this is the book here. Like that cost what? It, um, it's selling it here, of course, at 3750. Yeah. But what, it, I mean, what it cost? It, it costs Sam 100 thousand dollars actually to do that. For how many? Or a thousand. <clears throat> I'm going to do two hundred. A hundred thousand dollars for a thousand. Yeah. That's it's it's more than money. the uh, <laughs> the cost of the literal making of the book because he also supported me while mm -hmm. the book was in the process. So for two years he underwrote me. Mm -hmm. 